case that <laughs> exactly yeah so hey um let's um we've got a goodly number here i'm delighted that all of you are have have joined in this afternoon isn't it nice i don't if perhaps it's not out in hillsdale but today it's another day of 55 degrees and rain which is what i feel like it's been doing since oh i don't know march um <laughs> or snow uh, well you're right you're right it's not and that's exactly what it's doing in Hillsdale today. Yeah. Yeah. So, but um, I'll do, I'll do announcements at the end of our time. Um, and I want to start right now. I'm delighted that um, Archbishop uh, Melissa Skelton is with us. Melissa is, um, she is the Archbishop of, um, of New Westminster and the Metropolitan, she's got super good titles, and the Metropolitan of Vancouver and, U and the Yukon. So um, I imagine that all of those titles came with some outfits as well, Melissa. Be before that, Melissa was, um, she is an American, in case you were wondering, um, and Melissa was in Seattle before that. And she's the person who has put together something called the College for Congregational Development. And it is, it's a program that I had some experience with in Chicago. And I think it offers us something um, in the course of our pre-COVID world. And I also think in the midst of this world now. Um, so she's going to do a piece for us. You may see that Ellen Ekeveg is back with us. Ellen was our presenter last week, and Ellen's a trainer for the College of Congregational Development. And, and so she's, I think she's, um, I think she's either fangirling, I think she's fangirling, Melissa, is what, <laughs> is, is what she may be, may be doing. Um, and Melissa's going to offer us this, um, the notion of when we figure out and are true to our core purpose, how that enables us to um, continue to be effective and even more effective in the midst of uh, COVID tide. Um, so, um, Melissa, um, take it away. I'm going to, Melissa, before you start, I'm going to mute everyone. And then you can unmute yourselves as you need to. We'll do, Melissa will speak for about 20 minutes, throw questions into the, into the chat. We'll break up into small groups. I'll zoom her into some groups and then we'll come back after 20 minutes for a little bit, for 20 minutes more conversation. Melissa, you've got a combination here of absolutely amazing, stunning um, leaders who don't happen to be ordained and amazing, stunning leaders who happen to be ordained. Oh, fabulous. Um, so, all right, so I'm muting us, participants, okay, mute all, there we go, all right, and then Melissa, you're unmuted, and um, join us. Okay, go thank you, it. thank you so much, uh, Bonnie, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to see you all, and thanks for taking the time to be together. As Bonnie said, I, I, I uh, some, over about 10 years ago, I was, uh, we got a new bishop in the Diocese of Olympia whose one of his priorities was congregational development. And so he, his name is Greg Rickle. And so uh, he and I had known each other and knew I had a background in, in organization development and congregational development. And he asked me to uh, pull together an intensive training program that we then offered uh, about four months later in the diocese. So it was kind of a, uh, it was a rush to get it done. And uh, it's been going ever since. And a lot of dioceses in the US are currently doing it and a couple in Canada. So when I went to Canada, it, it came along with me and there are two dioceses in Canada doing it. So today I, I wanna, so I, I guess the thing to say is it also in my diocese, congregational development is, along with uh, injust justice for indigenous people. So those are our two top priorities. And so uh, this is something that, uh, that we focus on there as well. And of course, uh, with COVID uh, coming in and uh, seemingly turning our world upside down, uh, one of the things that 
our parish leaders try to remind themselves of it as well as I. Uh, what in the midst of all of this is the purpose of a parish church? And even though everything's changed, how do we, as, as a way to remain faithful to our calling and kind of as our own, um, for me, it, it lifts my spirits. Hey, Melissa, can I interrupt for just a sec? Every yeah. time you talk, your screen moves and I'm getting a little nauseous. <laughs> oh, well, it's probably because I gesture. So I'll, I'll try to stay still, it's on my lap. Well, that's ironic that yes. I talk about like gesturing. So yes, I'll be glad. Exactly, so uh, I, I won't do as much, but uh, I find it motivating to come back to some of the purpose of a diocesan officer, a parish church in the midst of everything that's changing. So that's the reason I thought it might be useful uh, to talk about that today. But first, and let me see if I can, uh, and I think Ellen might have done this uh, in her presentation as well. So I'm gonna share a piece of a little, little content here. I hope this, can you see it? Can you see it, Bonnie? Yes, I, yes, I can. We got yeah. eyeglasses. All right, you got eyeglasses. Like so, here. so, so a, a, an important thing to say first is, so I'm going to share a, what's called a model of what a purpose, what the purpose of a parish church is, and and to say something about what a model is is a model is simply a a pair of lenses through which we can look at something. In this case, our parishes as a way to think about them, assess them, and see them with greater clarity, uh, you know, during a, during a time period in which we're trying to refocus our attention. So uh, this little visual of, of the glasses is something I come back to as I think about any kind of model that we work with to talk about our, our congregations. So let me see, I'm gonna stop that. So, so just to, just to kind of get us warmed up a bit about purpose, why is the purpose of any organization or anything, uh, any church important? And I'm going to just share some visuals with you here. Here's the first one. <laughs> uh, so we all, whether we like it or not, we probably know this logo. And when you think about uh, this particular organization, in this case McDonald's, you know, they're, they're, they're a purpose, their purpose immediately perhaps springs to mind because we, we may be consuming part of their products or some of their products from time to time. So, so each organization or company and churches have to think about their purpose because it it assists them as they think about their focus and what they will and won't do, what they'll decide to put their time and energy against and what they won't. Here's one, uh, here's one organization or company. Here's another one. So if, if you think about purpose and we might see it differently, think about these organizations and what they do and what they put their time, activity, and money towards, and the purpose that that says. So here's another one. And this is what I work for. I don't know if you know this company at all. How many know this company? You know this company? <laughs> Some of us actually use this stuff, even though it tastes horrendous. Some people say, uh, I used to work for this company. So here's a, a very different company, and, and it has a particular purpose that it told us all about, and actually, the story of this company is that it went through a time period when it forgot some of its purpose, and it nearly went out of business during that time. And then it kind of came back to the center of what its purpose was. And it was offering uh, people natural products, products mostly sourced from nature, and giving back to, to the uh, communities in which the company found itself. So think about what you think the purpose of a parish church is. Just think about that for a minute. What I would say is, uh, or, or just something to note, I was never taught what it was when I went to seminary. 
I was taught about the mission of the bigger church, but I was never really taught about the purpose of a parish church. In fact, probably if I, if I picked up any clues about what the purpose of a parish church was, this is what I imagined it was about. It was about keeping plates spinning. You know what I'm talking about? Looking busy, <laughs> programs, people, numbers, acti just kind of unbridled activity, keeping plates spinning, which can be energizing, can be fun, can be, but it isn't really, it doesn't really speak to the deeper purpose of why many of us are either drawn to working in the church or to supporting those who work in the church. So let me just share another little piece here. We'll go back to our glasses for a minute, I hope. Yeah, there we go. So here's, here's the model, and let's get rid of Tom's and Maine. So this is a model that purports to describe and to visualize what a parish church's purpose is. And what I want you to do first is notice two things about it. One is it's a cycle. It's a cycle. In other words, it, you start someplace, you go someplace, you go another place, and then you come round about again. It's a cycle. It's something that repeats. Secondly is, and this is the really important part for us these days, it occurs in a context. It, it's, 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 a, it's against a field of a context, and con it sits in a context. It's, it's a cycle that just that isn't just sort of spinning out in, in, in nowhere land. It sits in a context. And so here's how I would describe what this purpose, what this uh, visual and these words are trying to tell us about the purpose of a parish church. And it's my hypothesis. Some would say it's the shape of the Eucharist. Some would say it captures exactly what the Eucharist is about. The purpose of a parish church is to assist God in the gathering of people into specific communities of faith. In Canada, we do call them parishes. In the US, we call them congregations to assist God in the gathering of people into specific communities of faith where they are, where they go through a process in which people are invited more and more and more to realize their baptismal identity and purpose, or some would say they become more Christ-like. And then those same people are sent into the world as salt, as light, as leaven, as the baptized into places like workplaces, family life, civic life, and for some are sent right back into vocations in the church. And then as you see the little arrows, they come down and they go back and that happens over and over again within a specific context. So the cycle repeats itself. We are not people in the, in the Episcopal church or in the Anglican church of you're baptized and that's, you know, you come to Jesus and that's it once and for all, you're done. You're done in terms of your formation. Rather for us, it's about this cycle. We are gathered, we, we go through worship, formation, the culture of a parish, uh, relationships with each other that then over time transforms us more and more into the baptized people with a purpose that we already are. We are sent. And then we're regathered, transformed, sent, regathered, transformed, sent, all within a specific context, all within a specific context. So some, some people used to call this, or th their version of it was, it was the filling station. I don't know. I'm old enough that that's what we were, what we called gas stations <laughs> way back when. The filling station version of the purpose of the church. It's not quite that same thing, but it, it's the idea is, you know, we, we come from everything that is both inspiring about the world and discouraging in the world. And we bring all of that into a community of faith that somehow shapes us, fills us, 
with with the, the love of God that then we are we are sent to to be the love of God in the specific places where we're planted, and then the cycle repeats itself. So what I mean by context is a particular time, a particular place. So often when we would teach this model in the College for Congregational Development, or as Canada calls it, the School for Parish Development, you know, we talk about things like people's neighborhoods, what it was like to be in a postmodern church, or what it was not like to be in a postmodern church. If we even use that term, we, we talk about it in a kind of, you know, in a, in a more limited way. But if you look at this model and you think about the way the context has shifted so fully, the way that the lives we're living have shifted on account of what we've just gone through and continue to go through, um, it, the model begins to look very different. So before the pandemic, the context was the neighborhood, um, what we do in the church that kind of um, helps people both recall and live more fully into their baptismal identity. And then we think about, you know, they go forth into the world. We thought about that, I'd say, in pretty conventional terms. Now, of course, as we think about gathering, we're talking about how do we gather in per without meeting in person? What are the real processes of transformation? What really matters to people uh, in terms of the process of, of transformation that they encounter once we gather not in person? And what's the reality of where people are being sent? What's the reality of, of where people are being sent? It's, it's different. It's different than it was two, three months ago. So we're sending people into you know, a place where jobs are scarce, jobs are lost, income is, uh, is diminished, where people are worried, where illness happens, and where some of us are dealing with the death of family and friends in ways we had never thought we would. So in, in this model, then, the context means everything. It shapes everything but the actions and the purpose is the same. We're still asking ourselves, how do we gather? How do we gather in this way? How do we gather, how do we assist God in gathering people in this way? What are the activities and, and the experiences, even in, in the tools we've got that can transform hearts, minds, and our actions to live more deeply into our baptismal identity and purpose? And where are we sent? What's the reality of the lives we're sent into? So some of this, I won't go through some of the detail about this model, but I would just, here's, here's some of the piece about sent. And you'll recognize uh, the BCP, the Book of Common Prayers, send us out to do the work you've given us to do and the actual places uh, we're sent into. So let me stop that share. So I wonder um, what sort of questions and comments you might have thinking about this, this way of conceiving of, of what uh, our purpose as, as individual churches are and, um, you know, in the particular situation we find ourselves in. Post questions out into the um, into the chat, or you can just uh, raise your hands there. All right, Melissa. I'm not seeing a lot of questions. Oh wait. Daniel wants you to repeat the question. Good move. Good move, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel largely still looking for his cheeseburger. Okay. Right. So, so what strikes you? What strikes you about the model? Is surprise or not? Or seem intuitively right? Or, and particularly, what does this model say, given what we're experiencing today? Uh, okay, I can. I'll speak to that. Um, I can't use this. 
um, this 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 seems um, uh, outdated. Um, there's when you don't have the ability to gather and that much emphasis on the gathering, mm. uh, then um, the rest of this is is difficult to live out. So, um, uh, and 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 I I would also say it seemed a bit consumeristic. Mm. as though the people needed to come here to then get filled up, to then go out. Um, and so, I, uh, but how I would address that uh, and, and alter this would be to, um, to think more as a leader who is seeking to lead and equip others for ministry engagement um, in different ways uh, within the people they know, as well as uh, outside of how we can then uh, reimagine what our mission is and how we can re-engage that uh, in a new and safe and different way. Mm. I would definitely incorporate in the transformational aspect of this. Uh, I would ask questions to my people as to why would, if you could gather, why do you come? What, why, what, what brought you to the point where going to church mattered to you? And, and I would like to hear those stories uh, as well as if they can tell me that and tell one another that, what would keep you coming? What keeps you coming if you could gather? And if you can't gather now, with uh, uh, what are some other things that have happened in your life that have strengthened your faith or well have have have, have uh, helped you as you reflect during these quiet times when you're you can't go and do anything or perhaps the Holy Spirit has led you to to recognize where uh, he's been at work in your life I think some of those conversations might lead to some new things. So how are people gathering? I guess I'm wondering how, if you can't, uh, so a thing we have had to deal with uh, is, of course, when you can't gather in person, what is the mechanism by which you can assist people to gather, even if it's not in person? I think we are gathering in things like this Zoom meeting. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. it offers an opportunity to invite others who might never go into the door through the doors of a church to gather right. with us. Uh, I'm going to do a, a, a little se couple sessions on prayer. And I just, you know, I'm thinking about it. I said to people, you know, if you have some friends that have questions, let me know, you know, see if they want to come join this because it's not within the confines of the church. Right. And I think it is a wonderful opportunity to be able to, to uh, bring people, uh, to gather people that wouldn't ever gather within the walls of the church. And it's also calling us to gather in new ways. I had a, a meeting with um, five parishioners this afternoon that I think we were probably more personal and more in depth with one another than we ever would have been in person because we are focused to, to focus in on the people that we're in the virtual meeting with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things, it, you know, so any kind of uh, theory about purpose, I should have said this too, it helps us focus what we are, what we want to be excellent at. I mean, it, it, often in the church, we don't want to use that word because that word frightens us because excellence is a lot to hope for, uh, sometimes with scarce resources and so much to do. But um, if we actually believe that assisting people to come together is part of our core purpose, then it means we have to really get with that, you know? We have to have mechanism, even when we can't do it in person, we have to work on what are the mechanisms. 
and we have to spread the gathering word. You know, uh, I had one congregation say, well, we're, you know, we used to have newcomer gatherings. We're not going to do it because now we're just on Zoom. And I thought, really? <laughs> Imagine having a newcomer gathering because some people are experiencing that whatever they're offering online on a Sunday morning has two to three times the numbers yeah. that, that they would normally be getting. And um, that's very intriguing to me. So that the, the opportunity for living more fully into gathering, you know, maybe right in our laps and we didn't know it or want it. <laughs> Necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say this is Ron Bird. Um, when we think about gathering or connecting, and particularly in a virtual environment, I want us to be careful because in, in some of that, we're assuming privilege. Mm. Um, I'm writing a piece right now about um, internet inaccessibility for particularly people of color, both in terms of brand, broadband as well as devices. So I think we, we need to continue to think further beyond that, even to some of what you may have seen on the news this week, folks doing um, drive-in church, for example. Yeah. So it's not just in virtual communities, but in other ways we have to look at this, particularly when we consider um, some of our most vulnerable. And, and when I speak about most vulnerable, I'm speaking about mature people who yeah. in some cases do not use the internet or do not use Zoom. Um, and also those that um, do not have accessibility or competencies for a virtual environment. So, so, that's, so that's great because that means what's the challenge for us? I, I mean, to, to me, it's, it's like, okay, if this is the issue, what's the way we can come at it this way? Because the, the rather conventional ways we think of gathering within person uh, which is inviting people, greeting them when they show up, uh, you know, assisting them to kind of get oriented, then, then doing something that further knits them in. It's a different thing. And, and uh, so what is the way? You know, what, what are our experiments in this way, particularly when we think about the most vulnerable folks who don't use technology, folks who can't afford it, what is the way? I mean, it's kind of like we're scrubbing back to the fundamentals. What we gonna do? You know, I mean, I really mean it. it it's, to me, it's as crazy and as awful as all of this has been, it's kind of like for the first time, we're getting to ask the fundamental questions all over again. Because we don't wanna be a place that just gathers the privileged or just those who know how to do Zoom. And I'm not, and I'm not as you can see, I, as I'm bouncing, <laughs> I'm not claiming I, I got it all down on that, but so what are the ways? So like in, uh, in one of our places, and it was a bigger place, and we don't have big churches in Canada. We really don't have big churches in Canada. We had a young intern who, for people who had phones, set up a thing where they called every, every individual person and then kind of, you know, then tried to set up a group where one person, not the clergy person, but subgroups that would call each other from time to time to really begin to, as Alice said, to, to kind of uh, enable people, enable in a good way, people to begin to care for one another, that it's not just a kind of the staff of the church is doing this for you, you know, that it really sets forth a different kind of energy than maybe we've, we've had in the churches before. So the, the chat, I mean, the question is, how are we going to rise to this challenge? And then with transformation, what is it? What actually matters to people to make them feel like they are utterly beloved of God? Because that's what baptismal, now my legs are shaking because I care about what I'm saying. Uh, uh, they're utterly beloved of God because that's what baptismal identity is. That we are once and for all loved forever and ever. It's indissoluble by God and baptismal purpose we can do likewise. So what are the things that actually get that through to people? Whether it's online, on the phone, writing a card, what is it? I'm struck by the notion of transformation. So much of that in our last 
uh, 40, 50, 60 years of the Episcopal Church has been around Eucharist. And we're, we're not able to do that. So what I'm super interested yeah. in is how does this transformation, what are the other modes and models and ways for us to gather and be transformed when we're not at this point able to physically gather for Eucharist? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what I'm really interested to see what, what folks are thinking about. Yeah, what, what do people think? What works for you? <laughs> Stories. The, the story sharing and, the, and and leaning into to the other part of the service, which is is word, and mm. people using words to reach out to one another, whether it be a card or a phone call or a Zoom birthday party gathering with one another, because to continue to nurture a relationship, there must be words. Mm. That's the that's that's the that's the foundational component of a relationship has requires words. So that's what I think. To answer your question about what works, um, we've just had some good old fashioned town hall meetings online and to, to Ron's per, uh, point that didn't include anybody. So we had to be really creative about making sure we reached out to those who couldn't be online to get their feedback. But I'll tell you what, what worked and what I've seen that's transformational about that is that people, my experience is that we, we need a way to grieve, mm. to talk out loud and in meaningful and powerful ways about what has been lost and what we're not going to be able to do mm. and just to see that in each other's eyes and and listen to tears i mean it felt sort of like a wake in some ways and um i don't know that at coffee hour back in the old days we were talking that deeply about what we long for what our community means to us what we need one another for. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential in smaller gatherings online or in people's yards in lawn chairs, <laughs> whatever, for like, can we, can we talk now? I saw a, a point that Chris Harris made about uh, recovery groups, and I'd love for, to hear him say more about that because what I've been experiencing lately feels more like clinging to each other in a very honest way that's not unlike recovery groups. So I'll, I'll just offer that. Yeah, that's exactly been the experience I've seen in our various online Bible studies and online forum groups where we're going deep with um, the word, but also going deep with our lives and our mm -hmm. longings and our um, regrets and our grief and our triumphs and our joys, even in this crazy world we're in. And yeah, I do think it's like a recovery group. I've always said Christianity is recovery uh, for all of us. Uh, and you know, there's that old joke about how the recovery groups, like the most powerful transformative spiritual work going on in the churches was happening in our basements, in the recovery groups, right? That old joke. And so here we are, um, we've all been ejected from our pretty buildings upstairs in our stained glass windows. And now we're uh, having to do, we're going to have to go back to the basic work of um, transformation and so mutual support and encouragement and honesty. And, um, you know, for the folks who are willing to go there, and that's been my experience and not everybody will, but for the folks who've been going there, it's been far more than, than used to be gathering in those ways. And they're going far deeper. And the, the personal growth that people report has been wonderful. It's been incredibly enlivening in my experience. I'd like to respond to the question too, in that I'm thinking about what Alice was saying about words, what Beth and Chris are saying about knowing each other. And it seems to me that Pauline notion there at the end of 1 Corinthians 13 about then we shall know even as we have been known 
Uh, there's something important and irreducible about the life of the local church as providing a place in which I can know and be known. Um, and how does that happen? How does that come about? Uh, people hear stories. Uh, sometimes I have to hear my own story uh, to have a place of people who give me the gift of listening to me in depth as I hopefully can give them the same gift to listen to them in depth. Uh, and out of our stories, uh, especially of the redemptive, transformative things that God has done in our lives, those witnesses uh, that entice people and raise a crisis for them, why? Why does it happen to Ron? Could it happen to me? Uh, to create that kind of critical possibility in people's lives to dare to believe. Uh, when I was working with EYSJ and some of my colleagues in the diocese know my feeling, uh, the people in EYSJ repeatedly, I heard throughout my time with them, told me that, um, <clears throat> wow, this experience is so meaningful for them. Now here they were paying 1,000, I forget how much money, a year to be part of EYSJ, to have an experience that for me raised the question, why aren't you having that experience at your local church for free? Mm. Uh, what, what did you learn to practice in EYSJ uh, that you didn't learn to practice in the local church? So, uh, and then the only other concern I would raise in response to the model is that it strikes me as understating the significance of the location, uh, the church in the place, Jesus in the village. Um, and and having a, a particular bond there. Great. I love it. <laughs> so I think the context, you know, uh, the reason I think I emphasized uh, the context as the, the bigger pandemic is um, just because that's that seems to be what uh, what we want to explore these days, but but I love the idea of Jesus in the village and um, and all of us know the specific neighborhoods, our places are located with the particular issues, the particular people who are who were who are able to be gathered. Just the walking neighborhood uh, makes each parish, even though we have a common purpose, gives each parish the particular personality, the particular way that it mediates the presence of God through a particular people. Melissa, I wonder in the in the SEND part of the Gather, Transform, SEND model, you, you listed all those areas and what I thought when I was looking at it was, and then it needs to be in our virtual world mm -hmm. and our online world. We're sent into our online world because so many of us are spending so much time there. And what, what does that look like yeah. uh, for, for all of us? Um, because I feel, and Paula was talking about this too, I feel like we're doing an awful lot of, of caring for each other, the others we know, but how is it that we find the ones that we don't know? And, and how are we doing those connections in this time um, when some of us are able to shelter and be on a screen. Um, so there's, I think there's that loss of the greater mm -hmm. world. Yeah, I was thinking uh, around send. Um, so the question I, so for, for my, um, just because I didn't have enough to do right now, I'm the priest in charge at the cathedral in Vancouver, British Columbia, because they were between interims. And uh, so that was my uh, re-entry into parish ministry. And it was, uh, I, I, I'm remembering how hard the work was and how gratifying the work was both. And so my, the question I posed to, to that staff is they were trying to think about what do we do uh, out of everything we could possibly do. So I asked, you know, when you, when you think about the people of the cathedral and the people, who, people in the neighborhood of the cathedral, what are the specific uh, and, and uh, elevated uh, and intense places of sending that, that are right before us? And though they don't have a lot of 
families with children, the ones that they have uh, were right at the top of their list, that those who are at home trying to caretake children or other people in their family, as well as work in, in, in a diminished but harder capacity, that those were the ones that they wanted to most support for those ministries in their lives. That and, uh, and the, the neighborhood of the cathedral in Vancouver is, is closest to the poorest zip code in, in, in Canada. And, uh, and all the food ministries shut right down once COVID happened, everything shut. And uh, it, high, high numbers of indigenous peoples in Canada that are in that zip code. And so uh, the uh, impetus to figure out how to safely begin to open back up those food programs was then what we put our put our attention to so it's th these are just these are actual you know questions to pose for yourself as you think about your particular congregation and what's the reality of the lives either right in the neighborhood or where the people of the congregation are being sent whether it's online bonnie or whether it's uh into homes or situations that are much more difficult than they were three months ago. Um, I'm not sure the inreach is, is, is not what we need to be doing right now because I don't think we were doing that before. We were coming, pretending that everything was fine and then leaving. And now with the inreach, we're getting to know each other better. And as we get to know each other better, we have something more to share with those who aren't with us. Yes. So I think the inreach right now may be the important thing for us to be doing so that our, our outreach is more authentic. Mm. Yeah. That well, I mean, when you look at what transforms, you know, there's a tendency to think it's programs. But what I'm hearing, and this is exactly what I would experience, you know, at the root of it, it, it is in what way are we an authentic expression, we ourselves, of what it means to live the Christian life with all the questions, all the difficulties, all the struggles, uh, the joys and the sense of community with, you know, being in community with one another. Um, that this has stripped away the kind of negative part of this, of a social veneer in which because people are having to be quite real with each other they must be real with each other i have to say this has generated the most in a chat we've ever had really? <laughs> yeah they're going nuts <laughs> this is good i guess <laughs> So another transforming thing, at least for me, because we can't sing anymore, is watching others sing. I mean, that thing the Episcopal Church did with the musicians, did y'all did y'all see that? Tears. <laughs> you know? I mean, maybe for right and wrong reasons, I don't give a hoot. It was, uh, I just, I, I, I always knew that music was transforming, and, but communal music or just music period. But that whole thing, and I, I don't know if in your open up plan that, that Michigan has put out, but ours is putting out one next week. You know, there's no congregational singing. And it is, it's, pro, it's, it's worse than letting the Eucharist go for a while for us. We've, we've, we've advised against it, and, and we're putting together a committee on how to use technology and music, um, how to use technology so that we can get music into as many congregations as possible in an appropriate way. Yeah. Um, so that's, so trying to work real hard on that because it's super hard. I've heard it said no one leaves repeating a line from the sermon. They leave humming or singing a hymn. Yeah. Yeah, we had one pair said, but could we hum? <laughs> I thought, I don't know that our guidelines are going to address that. <laughs> but, but I'm not going to stop it. 
<laughs> no. 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 So, Bonnie, do you want to send them into small groups or no? <laughs> you know what? We've got, you know, it would be about 10 minutes. So, um, what I'm going to say is let's go into small groups for 10 minutes and just get a, just sort of wander around for a bit, Matt. And, um, and, um, and then we'll, then we'll come on back and see if you've got some questions. Um, and we'll go, um, we'll go to about 10 after. So um, we'll be a little bit over our time, friends. Um, so, but how about we'll do that. Um, and I apologize, I have a dog who wants to engage in this. Um, uh, I'm just trying to keep still. <laughs> well, there's, yeah, she's, she's not trying to do that. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Do we have a question? Uh, I can give you one. I don't think they're going to hear it. <laughs> okay. right. But um, I can send it. So Melissa, tell me what the question is and I'll send it to them. Pull it up. Question to consider. Well, which one do you want to do, Bonnie? You want to do gather, transform, or send? Well, I just, I just, I was really struck by the, um, the, the literal nature of the gather. Yes, uh, right, yeah. So, um, I don't know, we didn't talk much about send, so maybe, or I don't know, which one, which one is the better question? Quick. So uh, what do your people need right now from your church to support their baptismal presence or their baptismal purpose? That's the percent question. What do your people need right now from your church to support their baptismal presence or their baptismal purpose? Okay, I'll do purpose because I don't know what baptismal presence means. Yes, it's what we ain't got but we want to have. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. Mark, I don't know. Have you ever met Ellen? Mark, Ellen, Ellen, Mark. Uh, yes, we met. Yeah, we met in oh, that's the, right. the, the five of us all met in April, I think. It was a long time ago, Mark. Oh. Yeah, it wasn't April. Yeah, no, you're right. We're all together. She really We're gets all, it. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, that's hilarious. I, I mean, I, I just, that just cracked me up no end with Alice. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> hey, you get a reaction. It, it um, I mean, we're a little bit longer and we're longer in the plenary, but the, this is the longest stream of chat I've ever seen. Oh, well, yeah. maybe, maybe Ellen, uh, Ellen loosened them up. <laughs> no. <laughs> but actually the question I want to answer is what have we learned about gathering? And, and to me, it's like, oh my God, there's so many opportunities. Yeah, I think there's tons more opportunity. I think we're, I think we have the possibility of gathering in a way. I think this is the way we finally knock out our inability to do small groups. Yeah, I know. Um, I think, I think that's what, I think that's what this time is. Um, and so many different ways to do it because, you know, you can do as many as you can imagine. So you can, you can gather people by how they're sent. Parents of kids, you know, yep. you're, are you pulling your hair out because of this? Well, you can gather that way. Now, of course, we always could, but we never really did. I mean, that, that's the weird thing. No. We never really thought of it that way. No, and you can do, you can completely, you could completely do stewardship that way. Yeah. And Ken and Callahan used to always talk about that. But you can you could completely segment stewardship by 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 types, and people always used to get mad at me when I would get too marketing about that. Yeah. Um, 
but when we did when we did more segmented asks like we would like the photos we'd send on the picture on the letter because nobody read the letter but we knew we had good pictures so if you had kids in the church school you got a letter that had a ton of kid pictures yeah um and you know if you did outreach you got a letter with all food pantry pictures now i'm gonna write this idea down <laughs> um, <and laughs> I, don't, I don't think money is your issue <laughs> oh always <laughs> but, but it but but you could get really segmented about it um and and he would talk about and what and one of his things he would always say is if you meet with have one-on-one -on -one conversations with 20 percent of your highest attended sunday so if you have 600 on a on Easter Sunday, and if you do 120 one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, but it, you split it up, right? You've got, if the rector does 30, because you're getting paid to do it, the associate does 30, because they're getting paid to do it, that's 60, and then you have the vestry do 10 each, done. Um, if you do that four to six months ahead of your stewardship campaign, you get a big bump. Uh, and it's and so, and I've seen it. And what I wonder about with all of these phone trees, yeah. if, if there isn't a massive, hey, Kit, join. If there isn't a massive depression, do we have the possibility of stewardship not cratering because we've done all this connection? Yeah. Kit, meet, um, meet Melissa Skelton. Hey, Kit. Hi, I'm sorry to be tardy, but I got in a uh, meeting with our sound guy about streaming and what we're going to need to do to upgrade to have good streaming when yeah. we can go back in church and stream. So yeah. he could meet at four. So I had to set up a Zoom. So sorry that's, I'm late. That's essential. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Kids at All Saints and All Saints and East Lansing. It's uh, a very vibrant congregation. Um, right College, there by Michigan yeah. State. Yeah. Um, so I take it they're all in breakout rooms? They are. You want to go to one? What are they doing in there? Yeah, arguing. <laughs> <laughs> if you put me in a good one. All right. Um, <laughs> who, who, tell me, tell me two people's names who you think would be fun. Um, Sarah Hurlbert and Susie Schaefer. Okay, let me find Susie. I didn't see if Sarah was in. Um, I love that though. So Ellen, what about you? Gather Transform Sin. What, what, what's your take on its relationship to what's going on? I feel what? like we need to figure out what the questions we need to be asking ourselves about gathering. Hmm. You know, like- the Breakout um, floor. Yeah. Uh, because I feel like, you know, well, I think colleagues here are, they're so focused on getting back in the building that they're not asking the right questions about what we should be doing when we gather. Yeah. What is the ultimate purpose of gathering? Yeah. And if we can figure out what that, is the purpose just to be back in the church? Because that, that purpose looks very different if the purpose is actually to connect and to support one another. Yeah. I don't feel like people are asking the right questions. Yeah, got it. Yeah, it can get so focused on just getting back in the building and yeah. just having the rudimentary of what we used to have. And the technicalities of all that. Well, I know because they're, for one thing, they're overwhelming. Yes. You know, not and that's all anyone has bandwidth for. I, I think. know, I know. Where I was like, you know, the conversation started in a manual and of course I'm stepping out of that conversation because I'm yeah. not going to be there, but it's like, you know, I'm just going, I think you're asking the wrong question. I think you're answer, you're not asking the right questions here. Yeah. I mean, what is really our purpose of gathering? What do we want to have happen when we gather? Yeah. And what do we lose by focusing on being back in the building? I think you lose a lot of what yeah. the ultimate purpose of gathering is. Yeah. There's, you know, Melissa, you might want to join it. Um, and I'll chat with Jennifer. We we're talking about who would be cool people who would be with us. Jennifer Baskerel Burroughs has put together an interesting group. Um, Sean Rose in it. And then 
Um, and then it's a lot of folks who have been ordained for like a hot flash minute as bishops and their canons. Um, and it's been kind of, it's really interesting what I was hearing people talk about. Um, Cause Joanne, we were, it seemed like we were getting to some of that this morning and that we were. Yeah. I kept thinking that model the whole time we were talking. And, and also this, the send part, what is sending yeah. look like yeah. in particular in this morning's conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is where I keep, when I keep getting to this, like, uh, and I just have to start writing stuff instead of talking about it, but this, this, you know, theology, you know, of a pandemic in yeah. theology in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah. Um, because the sen part is then how do we address this? How do we yeah. address these massive inequities? Yeah. Um, and and how do we address? How do we how do we then continue to connect to the people who have joined online, who aren't going to wander through these doors? Yeah. And 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 is it about like having people there or is it about tr the transformation of people's lives mm -hmm. and then and then here we go how much money do we need to make the structure go and what is the structure we need uh -huh. yes um, we won't know what the structure is until we know what our strategy is you know what i'm saying like every organization is designed to get the results it's getting <laughs> And any, any organizational design has to begin with what do we want? Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting point made um, this morning was that there are people who are hurting now that have been outside of the hurt bubble. And yeah. so now it's you, it's, it's me, it's people who That's don't right. have traditionally in that space yeah. and, that, and how that feels to them and what we need to do about that for people who aren't used to being in the hurt locker. And this, um, oh, and Mark, I'm realizing, Melissa, this is Mark Miliotto. He's our, he's our, um, our CFO. Oh, uh, I didn't know. Hi. Yeah. Hi, again. <laughs> no, no, I didn't know that was your role. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, he's, he's the keeper of the shoe boxes. You're like, ah, ah. Um, loved up, loved up. But, <laughs> you know what, um, Joanne, um, Jennifer, because someone brought brought up that notion of um, people like longing and almost fetishizing about the Eucharist, and we yeah. have to have it, we have to have it, we have to have it. Yeah. And Jennifer just went to, she said, you know, for 400 years, there's been a people in this country who have not had control of their bodies, you know, and now suddenly some people aren't getting what they want and they're demanding a different way. I mean, and it, and, but she said it without any edge. It was just boom, yeah. boom, boom. It was a surgical strike. Mm, yeah. Uh, on Diana Butler Bass's article. <laughs> Which I gotta say, I kind of enjoy. <laughs> what the surgical strike or the article? No, the surgical strike. Surgical strike yeah. for sure, Melissa. The surgical we, strike. We just yeah. we we get permission for anybody to do anything. So, <laughs> not really. Not when we gather. Sorry. But it was. I mean, it was. It was just interesting. Yeah. This notion of I must have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, well, aren't we kind of battling, well, this may be, I don't know, this is just a thought. I wonder if we're battling between the collective need and our individual needs in a way, like, uh, I don't know, I always feel like we're against this in the church. Everyone has these individual needs to be in their building and to have things the way they are when there's a larger mission and purpose that's collective. Yes. I mean, we're kind of in a, I mean, we're in this Christ, you know, this moment where the, you know, it's most, the organization's most open to change. You know yeah, what I mean? It creates that, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and my comment, this yeah, tension. in the, in the uh, uh, what was it? I guess it was the college, that uh, little thing we did on, uh, on um, models was, you know, it seems to me that the, the stakes around what is Christian maturity went yeah. from here to here. Here. As not, you know, we just, because we're so desperately in need of it, and particularly 
in the U.S. as you look around, the, the contrast is so great mm-hmm. between the national conversation and the individual. Uh, yeah, and what we aspire to be as a, you know, as a Christian church and as people. So, mm-hmm. but. Yeah. Um, so today, the sentence we want them to leave thinking with is? To me, is purpose actually stays the same. The way we do it is the challenge. That, that, that's what I am leaving with. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, uh, that, it, that it really is about gather, transform, send. The question is, with all the barriers, all the issues, all the everything, what you know? What what are you going to do to mm-hmm. continue that, that purpose? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Or to strengthen a part of it? I mean, I, I to strengthen a part of it um, intentionally. But that, that's. But but Bonnie, what what do you think? Um. I'm not, I'm not sure that we always know what our purpose is. Uh. Um, I, I think some of our places really do. Yeah. And, and I think some of our places think our purpose is to be a family for each other. Uh. Um, and whereas I think that's an amazing byproduct, I'm not sure it's the purpose. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and so it can feel like the purpose now because yeah. we need each other, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it could become that it, more yeah. solidly. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I don't, I don't hold against that. I'm just thinking, I think there's something, I mean, for me, it's to embody the gospel um, yeah. and, and those, and those teachings. And so that's, I think that's the piece that, um, I think that's the the thing that's um, that I always kind of try to go back to and figure out how am I doing that. Yeah. Um, and and if that's how we is that what we're structured to do? Because mm. you do what you're structured to do. Hi, Karen. Um, if you do what you're structured to do, then how do we need to be structured? Yeah. So. So I think this is a good di- little back and forth we just did yeah so. around, around this oh dear sue carter has a flooded basement so she needs to bail literally wow <laughs> i was i was seeing pictures of my um friends in chicago and i was seeing nothing but flooded streets in chicago and then people looking out for the locusts and the um, frogs coming next. Oh dear. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, pretty much same here. <laughs> it's flooded here really badly. <laughs> Is it really, Terry? Yeah, yeah. We had heavy, heavy rains today. I kept looking outside thinking, I mean, it was intermittent though. It wasn't all day. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah it's been pretty bad. Yeah, we've had a lot of rain. I haven't seen too much, too much flooding, but. Um, I, I did notice a hose for a house we considered buying that was like spewing water out from the basement. And I was like, oh, I'm glad we didn't buy that one. <laughs> All right, friends, any, any um, thoughts as we're closing up here? Insights that you came up with each other? Unmute yourself and talk if you got something. Hi, this is uh, Peggy Rose from Spirit of Grace. I'm disembodied. Um, are you hearing me? We we are hearing you, and we want to welcome you yet again, Peggy Rose. <laughs> yeah, so I had a nice conversation with uh, Jim Gettle on Friday, and um One of the things that I have been lamenting, and I don't know if it came up in any of the group chats, um, but um, 
I used to always joke about people who were chancel prancers and uh, because of my background, Lutheran calisthenics and all the moving about that we do in church. But I have to say that is the movement of worship I deeply miss, Mm. Um, just that rhythm. And uh, and I'll just say that. Yeah, that you're right. I do, too. Yeah. What other thoughts, friends? Questions for our, um, our Archbishop who's with us? Come on, y'all. We, uh, we started in our group talking about uh, families with young kids and um, how devastating it is to any, any of our congregations that still have kids in them. Um, and with summer activities, all the camps being canceled and at the same time, parents being expected to return to work. Uh, we're just gonna have a crisis so we're not exactly sure. Um, what to do about that, but just for pastorally to be more aware. Um, and even though the church can't be a physical structure with kids gathering in it, but we still need to, uh, to keep an eye on, on the family's well-being. Uh, and, and also, uh, Susan Schaefer reminded us that many families, uh, the kids were borrowing iPads from their school, and they're going to have to give those back. Um, So there may be some financial difficulty uh, for families to stay connected uh, with if they were borrowing tech. Mm -hmm. Wow. Would it be possible for us to have a written copy of the definition of the purpose of the church that you shared earlier, Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Bonnie, Bonnie actually has it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also aware of, um, the families in my context that are really burned out from Zoom. The parents are, the kids are, they don't want to, I can't, I can't engage them in conversation and planning and anything because the last thing they want to do is come back on Zoom. I'll see them sometimes on the Facebook Live worship. Like, like that's just a different platform for them. So they'll go to Facebook Live just because it's different than doing, because I do both. I, I stream from Zoom and Facebook Live. So they'll show up on Facebook Live, but not Zoom because they're t- so tired of it. So and that, so that's a big challenge, right? Because we want to stay connected and we want to offer them opportunities, and, but they're just really tired of this of this medium after their days. We're all tired of Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I'm grateful for it and tired at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Susie Susie Schaefer's got a good point. She said she, her experience was seven year olds, and maybe. Uh, Emily, you can uh, chime in here that they ha- seem to have a 16 minute attention span on Zoom. <laughs> that long, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was doing children's chapel for quite a while um, up and through Easter and it was about 10 minutes working okay. with, the, with the three and four year olds, about 10 minutes. That, was, be, that, that was it. To be fair, Eric Williams apparently is only in for 16 as well. <laughs> It does make me think about, though, um, what other tangible expressions we might come up with, like what we might drop off on somebody's porch. Um, I I fall into that demographic with a six-year-old and eight-year-old, and like, it would bring tears to my eyes for like, you know, for somebody to drop something off on my porch, you know, a book or, you know, we're actually it's really hard to find children's books because the libraries are closed too. And then when we have to return the iPad, we won't have access to as many books as we do now. Um, But imagining like a church or another organization dropping off a few children's books on our porch, like with a note, like, Hey, thinking of you hang in there would be pretty awesome. So I'm starting to talk with my parish too about like, what can we drop off on people's porches or drop in people's mailboxes? That's a tangible expression that we're thinking of, of them. Um, and we understand how things, how hard things are right now. Yeah. Super helpful. Yeah. All right. Any closing words, Melissa? You got to close for us, and then I'll do some announcements. Then you close too. So I, 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 the reason I shared this model is 
I, I do think even with the barriers, the issues, kind of being reminded of what, however we articulate the purpose of our, of these extremely important, valuable local communities of faith will help us. And, and most of what we're doing is experimental. And, and then we learn what doesn't work. And so I think it is a, a real dynamic of uh, finding our way through this. And, uh, uh, and I think it, from at least where I sit, it involves all those three components. It is about noodling through gathering. It is about working with what is transformative to take us into greater Christian maturity. And it is about, you know, taking that out into the world. And so it's the interaction of those three things that um, helps me stay centered as I try to figure out out of the million things I could be doing in a parish setting, what am I going to focus on today? And Bonnie, you had another way of saying it. Um, well, partly what I'm thinking about is in this moment, how is it that we, how is it that we wind up embodying the gospel? And, and, and that's, and for me, it's, that's about the send part, but the form part is how we figure out what those values are. And, and what I'm really think curious is in this very porous time how as we come back but and not come back but go forward as we go forward into the next how do we want what do we want our the what do we want to be able to convey and receive from the people who we have connected with and will connect with. And, and then how does that, how is that shaped by our gospel? Um, and, and I'm, that's, that's part of what I, I keep thinking about. And, and how do we ensure that we're not, that we don't become myopic? Hmm. Um, that if nothing else, I feel like we have the possibility of saying no more can we can we say that the disparities don't exist we we they're they're here they're present so what does what does that look like um so um so there we go um let's see okay um uh, Ellis is Ellis is asking to do a closing prayer. So Ellis, I'll let you do that. But I'm going to first say, ask um, Joanne Hardy. She's like, whoa, um, Joanne, would you um, would you talk a little bit about the CPG um, uh, the CPG waivers um, to remind people about that? Um, that we so, talked about on the call at one o'clock. Yeah, thank you. There is still the offer open from the church pension fund to do a waiver for pension contributions for congregations. So we need to get that back out again. And when we sent it out before, we realized we were pretty much all in a panic and folks weren't really focusing on that. But we think we are thinking in the diocese that there may be a need for some congregations to get the bishop to do a waiver for, I believe Mark can correct me, a month of pension contributions. So we'll get the information out again and we can reconnect with everybody on that to see what the needs may be. So we can then make a realistic waiver, um, have the bishop do a waiver for those congregations. Okay. We're not gonna have a meeting next week. I am completely and utterly wed to my fantasy of it being Memorial Day weekend. Um, and so I'm just going to have a virtual um, barbecue with, with I don't know who. Uh, I have to dig up some friends, but I am just committed to that being Memorial Day weekend and the start of the summer. So we won't be meeting then. We'll be meeting um, the next Mondays and the next Monday, but we will have our um, meeting this Thursday. We'll be a check-in. And then the following Thursday is again movie night. And I will be giving, um, I'm taking suggestions and I'm giving more weight to fluffy movies. Um, super fluffy 
movies is what I am looking for. It turns out my soul can't stand a long, torturous path and then a little bit of redemption at the end. Oh my God, that's it. Chris Harris, you got it. That's what we're doing. Groundhog Day. Boom. I love making decisions. You said you guys like clarity. Boom. Groundhog Day. Um, uh, so, and Melissa, thank you so much for being with us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so, and Ellis, take us away in prayer, please. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, a prayer that I've been using on every appropriate occasion during this COVID-19 crisis is a litany for use during the COVID-19 crisis. It was composed by the Reverend Gemma Allen, who is an Anglican priest in uh, New Zealand and Polynesia. And everybody, uh, several petitions for this. Your response is, gracious God, receive our prayer. Let us pray. For those who are sick and those who care for them, that they might be restored to health and receive all that they need this day. Gracious God, oh, receive yeah. our prayer. For those who have died and for those who mourn, that they might know consolation. Together. Gracious God, God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For nurses and doctors and all who work in hospitals and medical care, that they might be sustained with energy for their work and might have all that they need for good patient care. Together. Gracious, Gracious, Gracious God, God, receive our, receive our prayer. prayer. For public health experts, for scientists and bioengineers working to understand the virus and to find treatment and prevention, that they might have insight and success. Together, gracious God, God, receive our prayer. prayer. For the World Health Organization, for governmental officials, that policies and practice might be wise and effective. Together, gracious, gracious God. God. Receive, receive our prayer. prayer. For those in quarantine, that their spirits might be sustained, and for those separated from people that they love by the circumstances of this illness, together. Receive, gracious, gracious God, God receive, receive our, prayer. our prayer. For those who are afraid, that they might know peace, together. Gracious, gracious God, God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For those who are being harassed or persecuted as racism is expressed around this illness, that they might be protected together. Right. Gracious, Gracious God, God, receive our, our prayers. prayers. For those whose sin of racism clouds their eyes and minds and hearts, that they might repent and love their neighbor together. God, Gracious God, 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 God receive our, our prayers. Prayer. Finally, Gracious God, receive our prayers, those made with these words and those made in the murmurs of our hearts. In Christ's name, together we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you all. Be safe. Be well. Be safe. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.